All right, we're just after one o'clock now, so I will get the ball rolling. So thanks everyone for joining. Um, just a couple items to go over before our presenters get going. So welcome on behalf of the AFTOA. I am Amy West. I'm the secretary with the Board of Executives for the Alberta Fire Training Officers Association. Uh, just a couple housekeeping rules. If everyone could keep their mics and cameras turned off throughout the session, that would be very helpful for our presenters. Um, so if you need to leave the session at any time, you will have to be readmitted to get back in. So just be patient. Um, I'll try and keep an eye on this throughout the presentation. And you will have an opportunity to interact uh, with the chat panel feature. So if you look on your right hand side of your screen or if you're on a tablet, I believe it's at the top in the right hand corner, there's a chat function. And you can open that up and you can use this function to ask any questions that you might have of the presenter presenting team or myself. So we have uh, Chief Steve DBN from uh, Clearwater as well as Assistant Chief Evan Stewart on the line. So they'll be monitoring and asking questions uh, throughout or answering your questions throughout. And if you have any questions specific for the AFTOA, I might be able to answer as well. So I'll keep an eye on it. All right, so uh, today we're gonna be going over Alberta Wildland Urban Interface for Leaders. So this program is designed specifically for council members, CAOs, directors of emergency management, fire chiefs, and fire officers, um, probably more so specifically in the municipal fire departments. But um, the idea is to help achieve an understanding of common fire ground terminology, basic field operations, fire weather forecasting, and government documentation pertaining to wildland urban interface events. So this program is again part of the series developed through the joint initiative between the Alberta Fire Chiefs Association and the Office of the Fire Commissioner. And presenting today, like I mentioned, we have the WUI team from Clearwater Regional Fire Rescue Services. Um, so without further ado, I'll turn it over to them for their introductions and the feature presentation. Perfect. Thanks, Amy. <clears throat> and welcome, everybody. Um, Amy quickly mentioned that's Fire Chief Steve DBN, and I'm just going to intro the crew and we'll get started. So this is an exciting opportunity for our crews to present this to everyone today. Over the last eight months, the Clearwater and High Level Wui crew have been working to develop these programs. The research and development, along with their experience, has been a great opportunity for these crews, or these crew members, to bring these programs together. The hard work and dedication by both crews has been outstanding. All of this would not have been possible without the support from the Alberta government, or the OFC department, Alberta Fire Chiefs Association, the high level and Clearwater councils, and the WUI team members themselves. Today's program is geared towards elected officials, CAOs, DEMs, and fire officers. This will be the first time the crew has been presenting this program, and we expect it to be between an hour and a half to two hours. To keep things flowing, uh, the Clearwater Assistant Fire Chief Evan Stewart, any high-level WUI member and myself will be in the chat answering questions. At the completion of today's uh, program, we encourage you folks to provide us with your feedbacks along with your comments. The goal is to create and strengthen our program to meet the needs of all of you folks. Without further ado, I'll turn this over to WUI team lead Jared Optendries for the program. And again, thank you for joining us. Thanks, Chief. Welcome everyone, and thank you for attending the Wildland, Alberta Wildland Urban Interface for Leaders presentation. My name's Jared Optendries. As Chief said, I am the Clearwater Regional Fire Rescue Services Wildland Urban Interface Team Lead. <coughs> Along with me, I have my teammates, Mike Vig, Nathan Foster, and Rob McNeil. Uh, we'll each be delivering a portion of this presentation to you today. So this program was built in partnership with the High Level WUI team, uh, the Alberta Fire Chiefs Association, Alberta Wildfire, uh, Alberta Emergency Management Agency, and the province of Alberta. Again, this program is designed for CAOs, Directors of Emergency Management or DEMS, uh, council members, fire chiefs, fire officers. So throughout this presentation, we'll be discussing a brief overview of the wildland urban interface fires, some terminology on the fire ground, 
as well as an interview of basic field operations, some fire weather forecasting, and a little bit of government documentation pertaining to WUI events. So in July of 2019, the Alberta Fire Chiefs Association with the, with the fire commissioner funded two teams in the province. Municipalities were able to apply to host the departments for the, to be hosting departments for the team. Clearwater Regional Fire Rescue Services and the High Level Fire Department were awarded each a team for an initial 18 month contract to build and start uh, the Alberta WUI training program. Both teams are also equipped and ready to deploy as an initial response to help set up the incident organizational structure and also mentor incoming crews. Both teams consist of four full-time staff with extensive structural wildland and WUI training. The teams have developed three programs during this initial validation year so far including the S115 which is basically a one day <clears throat> wildland urban interface course and the S215 which is a more in depth uh, two and a half day course which expands on all areas of the S115. And of course this, the Alberta Wildland Urban Interface for Leaders program. So in the course content, Uh, we're going to get into what, in the introduction, what is Wildland Urban Interface, or WUI for short, as you're hearing. Where is it? Then we'll get into some prevention and mitigation strategies, uh, touch on fire weather forecasting, uh, overview of organizational structure, some uh, equipment and resources, and then briefly touch on some things to think about for insurance and liability. So introduction to wildland urban interface. Wild, wildland firefighting by itself is a very challenging and by adding structures and other improvements into the, the equation, it greatly increases the complexity. Over the last several decades, an expansion of communities, homes, and other improvements into the wildland areas has created a significant challenge for fire service agencies responsible for providing fire protection in those areas. WUI fires often overtax fire agencies resulting in an activation of mutual aid or automatic aid agreements to augment jurisdictional resources Nearly every WUI fire includes response from a variety of wildland and municipal fire agencies. This results in the need for clear communication and common terminology. Successful WUI firefighting operations are accomplished by selecting sound strategies supported by effective tactical actions that keep firefighters safe protect the public and minimize loss. So here we have the Alberta Forest Protection Area or the FPA. So there's 10 areas with the addition of the provincial headquarters in Edmonton. Uh, jurisdictional boundaries are typically located in the areas of highest fuel loads for wildfire. Uh, they're separated into manageable, manageable sizes that can be divided by geo-references such as rivers, mountain ranges, Sorry, just one more reminder, please uh, ensure your mics stay muted. Thanks. All right, thanks, Amy. Um, Alberta has demonstrated commitment to the principles of sustainable forest management and responsible stewardship through the development of rigorous legislation 
policies for protection, conservation, and suitable sustainable management for forests. Alberta works with forest industry representatives to develop long-term plans that ensure forest values are maintained for future generations. <clears throat> with all that being said, this does not mean you cannot have a woo event outside the FPA, such as in the grasslands. We'll get more into depth into this later. So what are the wildland structure environments? So first we've got the, on the left, we've got the interface condition where structures abut the wildland. This means that there's a clear line of separation between structures and the wildland fuels along roads or fences, things of the sort, usually identified by housing developments adjacent to wildland areas. With interface conditions like this, there's a greater potential for house to house ignition. Next in the middle there, we've got occluded. So occluded is a condition where fuel areas are surrounded by structures. This is the opposite of interface where structures surround the wildland fuels. Are surrounded, sorry. Occluded is the wildland fuels surrounded by structures. This example in the middle, of course, is uh, Central Park in New York. And over on the right, we've got what they call intermix. Intermix is a condition where structures are scattered throughout the wildland area. So there's no clear line of separation and the fuel, wildland fuels are continuous outside of and within the, the developed area. Usually they're more complex to triage and defend in interface conditions. Inter Mix is often referred to as interface as well. Kind of interchangeable, but not really. Just understand the difference between the two. Now I'm going to pass it over to my teammate, Nathan Foster. <clears throat> Thanks, Jared. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Nathan Foster. I'm a member of the Clearwater Regional Fire Rescue Services Wildland Urban Interface Team. And today I'll be talking to you about prevention, mitigation, and fire weather forecasting. In this slide, you can see Zama City, Alberta, a small northwestern community located 90 kilometers south of the Northwest Territories border. A perfect example of how a community has constructed a fire break as a pre suppression fire smart plan measuring at 50 meters wide. Wildfire has helped shape Alberta's landscape for generations. As a province population grows, communities become more intertwined with Alberta's forests, the risk of wildfire grows significantly. Almost all communities in Alberta face some wildfire risk. Proactive measures must be taken by community members and leaders to reduce this risk. FireSmart is living with the potential of wildfire and managing it properly. Preparing for the threat of wildfire is a shared responsibility between community members, community leaders, forest companies, industry, and governments. We all have the responsibility to lessen the chance of wildfire FireSmart measures the sorry FireSmart uses the measures to reduce the risk of wildfire threat to Albertans and their communities. FireSmart can reduce the likelihood of large uncontrollable wildfires across Alberta. Whether you're living in a forest protection area or not, FireSmart is is the responsibility that everyone has to take into consideration. From home, work, or outdoor hobbies and interests, Fire Smart affects us all. Who is responsible? We all are. 
Fire protection challenges faced by Albertans are beyond the capabilities of any one agency or group. The key to resolving the problem is working together for successful control in the wildland urban interface. People must work with emergency response agencies to manage fuels, make buildings fire resistive, and develop appropriate infrastructure and planning. Elected officials are responsible for land use policies that promote health, safety, and welfare of the public. Municipal planners and developer, developers are responsible for designing and building fire smarted buildings in surrounded areas. Property owners and residents are all responsible for providing fuel modified areas around their properties and constructing buildings in compliance with the fire smart guidelines. The most effective way to reduce interface fire hazards is to construct buildings, treat vegetation within 30 meters of buildings in compliance with the fire smart guidelines. Hazard reduction strategies are the responsibility of the property and homeowners. Fire smart Canada has main, seven main disciplines, education, emergency planning, vegetation management, legislation, development, interagency cooperation and cross training. These seven disciplines can be found and broke down more in depth at firesmartcanada.ca. This is a great reference for everyone to look into to educate themselves a little further at home as a property owner. Fire smarting at home starts with the materials used during the construction of your house. The combustible materials that you store around your property and the vegetation around your home. The gutters on your home provide a perfect place for combustible debris to accumulate and open eaves create an entry point for sparks and embers. With the exception of your roof, your siding material is the most reactive to wildfire. Combustible de debris can accumulate in the vents and the openings on your home and can be ignited. The roof is the most exposed co component on your home. Sparks and burning embers from wildfire can travel long distances and quickly ignite flammable roofing materials. A class A fire rated roofing material offers the best protection. Examples of a class A roofing material include clay tile, concrete tile, metal and asphalt shingles. FireSmart Yard includes making smart choices for your plants, shrubs, grass, and mulch. Selecting a fire resistive plant can increase the likelihood of your home surviving a wildfire. Ensure that there is a 1.5 meter non-combustible surface perimeter along the outer walls of your primary structure or home. Keeping a fire smart at home and community matters to you, the people around you, and your first responders. Sprinkler pre-plan. Pre-planning is essential for any emergency preparedness and should be created prior to any emergency. These plans can serve as an excellent tool for quick deployment of sprinkler systems Sprinkler systems can be a simple to compact, complex, sorry, based on a variety of factors. It is important to ensure your plan is as detailed as possible, including an adequate water source, tank and pump sites, supply and sprinkler lines, fuel breaks, safe refuge areas, evacuation routes, and other major potential hazards. Sprinkler pre-plans are the most important for quick deployment, the property, the resources, for the protection of people, property, and the environment. Alberta Naturals, Natural Regions. There are six natural regions found in Alberta. The Boreal Forest, Rocky Mountains, and Foothills region make up most of your bigger fuels, including your black spruce, jack pine, lodgepole pine, and aspen. 
Typically fine fuels are found throughout Alberta, but mostly in the grasslands. Foothills and parkland regions. In these regions, you will find a number of mixed fuels, but primarily grasses. The photo above is from Chuck Egg Wildfire and high, high level last year. Fire behavior forecasting. The fire behavior triangle is made up of three categories. Topography. Topography refers to the slope of the landscape and affects the rate and the direction of the fire's spread. Fires move faster uphill than downhill. The steeper the slope, the faster the fire will move. A fire can also travel downhill in rare occasion because of strong downdrafts. These are mostly found, downdrafts are mostly found in the mountainous areas. Slope. The steeper the slope, the closer the flames are to the fuels. As the fire spreads faster, it will also preheat fuels. Slope has a direct effect on rates of spread. Aspect. Aspect is the direction of slope in relation to the sun. South facing aspect always being the hotter, drier side. Aspect has effect on temperature, local winds, relative humidity, and fuel moisture. Wind. You must constantly monitor wind direction and speed. It will increase rates of fire spread. It contributes to the drying of fuels, determines the direction of fire spread and its shape. High winds will also start to create a large amount of spotting depending on the fuel type. The term spotting refers to a non-local creation of new fires. Spotting is often mentioned as being one of the biggest most biggest and most difficult problems for any wildfire management temperature temperature has an inverse relation to relative humidity as it gets hotter rh goes down as there's less moisture in the air temperatures are usually lower in the evening and overnight periods as well as early in the morning the typical Peak burning period in Alberta, depending on location, is anywhere from 1,400 to 1,800 hours. Relative humidity, or often called, called and referred to as RH. The amount of moisture in the air divided by the maximum amount of moisture the air can hold. Low RH means dry air, meaning a high probability of a start during that burning period. RH expressed as a percentage. Low RH, 30%, very dry, quick ignition, rapid buildup, high possibility of crown fires. Mild or medium RH, 40%, dry, high chance of ignition, moderate to high burning conditions. High RH, 60%, very humid, little chance of ignition. <clears throat> Throughout the next few, few slides, I'll discuss fire weather indices and fuel types that will directly work together in the fire weather index codes. Fire weather indices, the dryness in the forest fuels, and given the moisture of the burning conditions that can be expected for your standard fuel type. Indices are made up of a number of different codes and indexes that play a direct role in the fire danger rating system. Four main weather elements to consider are temperature, relative humidity, wind, and 24-hour precipitation. Low being wet and rainy with significant rain levels. Moderate being scattered showers throughout the forecast, but still seeing high, higher temperatures during the typical burning period. High or very high is your typical hot summer day for a few days on end with no adequate rainfall or precipitation. Extreme applies to a level of fire behavior characteristics that requires 
difficult fire suppression strategies. One or more of the usual, sorry, one or more of the following is usually involved. High rates of spread, crowning and spotting, wind shifts, fire whirls, and strong convection columns. Relative humidity less than 15%. Transition from surface fire to crown fire and increased spotting. Crossover. Crossover is the point of which the RH is less or equal to the temperature. This is a strong indicator of higher extreme burning conditions for that period. Red flag warning. Red flag warning would be tar targeted at the fire weather and danger conditions potentially leading to a blow up fire behavior. This would pose a critical degree of danger to the fire line personnel and public. The red flag warning would be issued at least 24 hours before an expected event. This will make a little bit more sense the further I, I go along, but the FFM sees during a red flag warning need to be at 92. The buildup index of 103 or more in crossover conditions with sustained winds of 30 kilometers an hour or winds exceeding, exceeding 50 kilometers an hour. All play a factor in the red flag warning. Fine fuel moisture code often referred to FFMC. FFMC play a significant factor in early spring and fall wildfire season. FFMC is a content of litter and other cured fine fuels. This is made up mostly of dead and down needles, leaves, as well as lichen, mosses, and other small loose debris and twigs. This formula comes from yesterday's fine fuel moisture code and the local dry bulb temperature. The local dry bulb temperature, or the DBT, is the temperature of air measured by a thermometer freely exposed to the air but shielded from radiation and moisture. When I say radiation, I mean it's not in direct heat. The formula is also includes relative humidity, wind speed, and 24-hour precipitation. Duff moisture coat. Duff moisture coat is loosely compacted organic layers on the forest floor of moderate depth. The DMC is a, gives an indication of fuel consumption in a moderate duff layer and medium sized woody material. The dryness of the medium sized surface fuel and upland duff layers measuring approximately two to 10 centimeters in depth. This formula, formula comes from yesterday's DMC and the local dry bulb temperature, relative humidity, and 24-hour precipitation. Drought code. Drought code is a numerical rating of the average moisture content of deep compacted organic layers on the forest floor. The DC is a useful indicator of seasonal drought effects on the forest fuels and in deep duff layers. The dryness of the largest surface fuel in deep duff layers approximately 10 centimeters or more. This formula comes from yesterday's drought code and the local dry bulb temperature and 24 hour precipitation. Average drought codes are in the 189 range and can be found as high as 800 or more. Initial spread index, ISI, is a numeric rating of the expected rate of spread. It combines the effect of wind and FFMCs on the rate of spread without the influence of variable quantities of fuel. A relative measure of how quickly a fire can be expected to spread. This formula comes from the FFMC and wind speed. Average ISI is 4.5 to 8.5 meters a minute in C2 boreal spruce.
BUI, buildup index, is a relative measure of the amount of fuel available for ignition during a wildfire. This formula is made up of the DC and DMC Hopefully everyone's still awake after all that. Fire weather index. A relative measure of potential fire intensity or energy available to be released. The fire weather index is a numeric rating of fire intensity. It combines the ISI, the BUI. It is a stable and general index of overall fire danger throughout the for forecasted forest areas of Canada. As you can see by looking at the chart using the indices, you have a pretty good prediction on the fire activity for the current burning period or your next burning period. Fire weather index system. Here is a breakdown of the fire weather index system that is used across Canada. The fire weather index system allows us to predict and plan for suppression efforts as well as fire behavior predictions on a larger scale. Predictions can be seen anywhere from a month to six months out. Head fire intensity, HFI. Head fire intensity is often referred to as rank on the fire line. Head fire intensity is predicted intensity or an energy output of the fire at the front or the head of the fire. Each class is a rate of heat expressed in kilowatts per meter of, of the flame front. HFI classes are indicated for fuel type at each weather station listed on your PPS, PPS or IAP. The average HFI that you will see in Alberta's, in Alberta during fire season is generally HFI of three or greater. You will see HFI chart printed daily on your morning IAP incident action plan or your PPS, pre-suppression preparedness system, and a predicted weather for that burning, burning period. Hazard rating and indice chart. This chart will give you a very good overview of how your current or future fire weather indices will be shaping up for the burning period. Many firefighters refer to this chart in a pocket size printout on the fire line during initial action. That concludes my portion of the presentation this afternoon. I thank you guys for your time and hopefully everyone is still awake and still staying engaged. I'll now pass it off to my team member Rob to discuss organization. Perfect. Thanks, Nate. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Rob McNeil. I'm a member of the Clearwater Regional Fire Rescue Services Wildland Urban Interface Team. Moving on here this afternoon, we're going to get into the organizational structure. Uh, this may be a refresher to some and uh, maybe some informative information for those that uh, are maybe new into this. So this section is going to discuss areas such as the incident command system, the organizational chart, the unified command, mutual aid, and state of local emergency. So looking at the incident command system, uh, referred to as ICS, we're going to talk about what is ICS, why is ICS used, and what are some benefits to agencies using this model in an emergency or disaster situation. Uh, talking about the organizational chart, uh, understanding what that chart looks like and how that uh, organizational structure is gonna expand uh, as the incident uh, carries on. Looking at unified command, what is unified command and what are some advantages to agencies who enter into unified command and what are some situations that are gonna call for the use of it. Mutual aid, we're going to talk about what it is and what are some specifications uh, for some effective agreements with mutual aid. And getting into the state of local emergency, so why municipalities declare a state of local emergency. 
So it's important for municipalities and organizations with jurisdictional authority to understand the importance of the ICS and the unified command structure. So agencies uh, must also understand their role and where they fit into this organizational structure. And to better help with this, the Local Authority Emergency Management Regulation has set forward a set of requirements for municipalities to adhere to for individuals that are going to have a role within the emergency management. So talking about the training requirements that are set forward by the Local Authority Emergency Management Regulations, uh, these uh, authorities must meet the requirements for the regulations which have come into effect as of January 1st, 2020. Uh, and so talking about the elected officials, they will be required to uh, complete the municipal elected officials course and this must be completed within 90 days of taking their official oath or by January 1st, 2021, whichever is later. Uh, looking at the directors of emergency management who will be required to complete their basic emergency management course and the incident command system ICS 100, 200 and 300. Uh, so a little more in depth for, for DEMS to have an understanding. Uh, they must also complete the director of emergency management course. Uh, these courses must be completed by the Dems within 18 months of being appointed or by July 1st, 2020. Looking at municipal staff. So all staff who have been assigned responsibilities within the emergency management plan must complete their ICS 100. This course must be completed within six months of being identified for this role or by January 1st, 2020. So all of these, these courses that are set forward for these positions, this is gonna give everyone within that role an understanding of kind of where they fit within this organization uh, and, and to help kind of suit their agency the best they can. When we start looking at the incident priorities, uh, three incident priorities uh, in order uh, from highest priority first. Uh, priority one, of course, is life safety, uh, first and foremost. This is gonna be in respect of both responders and the general public. Uh, we need to ensure that when we get somewhere, um, we're taking all the precautions necessary to make sure that we're safe. Uh, without that, we can't even get to the next priorities. Uh, number two, incident stabilization. So this is going to be accomplished uh, through establishing your command, setting your objectives, strategies, and tactics, and initiating action on the incident. Uh, priority three is looking at your property and environmental conservation. So uh, what we're talking here is to ensure that the incident does not cause further damage to the property and also looking at protecting the environment from any further effects from the incident. So looking at management by objectives, when, when we talk about that, and you'll hear that uh, throughout ICS, we're talking about um, managing your objectives uh, in regards to your incident priorities. So those objectives are gonna be based around your three incident priorities, and that's kind of what's gonna set the stage uh, for your incident action plan. So the management by objectives is used to communicate functional actions throughout the entire organization and can be accomplished through your IAP. Okay, jumping right into ICS and what is ICS? The incident command system is a standardized management concept that allows users to work efficiently under a single organized structure. This model helps to ensure efficient and effective management and it's done, through, done so by integrating personnel, facilities, procedures, equipment and communications into one common structure. So you can see on that chart there, 
um, all the various roles uh, within the command and general staff, it's all integrated into one structure. There's a lot that goes on behind the scenes, uh, not just, you know, the, the men and women with the boots on the ground on the fire line. There's a lot that goes into that. So by putting all of this into one common structure, uh, it helps to create a whole lot more efficiency and effectiveness when dealing with, with emergencies. So the incident command system allows for organizational structure to match the complexities and demands of the incident and or disaster situations without being hindered by jurisdictional boundaries. It allows for cooperating agencies to enhance their incident response. Uh, there's also a wide variety of applications that can be used, uh, that this ICS model can be used in. So whether that's fire or both wildland and structure, uh, natural disasters, could be talking about tornadoes, floods, storms, earthquakes, uh, search and rescue missions, hazardous material incidents, uh, even down to planned events, whether that be parades, demonstrations, sporting events, concerts, things like that. They're all examples of where this ICS can be applied to, to manage the incident that's taking place. So the ICS system is designed to be used from the time the incident occurs or begins until the time that the need for management or operations no longer exists. So the system is designed, of course, to meet the needs of any kind or size. So whether you're looking at a, a, a single residential structure fire, or you could be looking at a wildland fire that exceeds into several municipalities. Uh, it's to be usable for a variety of events, as I mentioned, from planned events uh, right through to complex emergencies. It allows for personnel from different agencies to join into one common management structure, and it helps to provide logistical and administrative support to the operational staff. So as I mentioned before, there's a lot that goes on behind the scenes, uh, not just the operational side of things. Uh, so it's also designed to be cost effective uh, by avoiding a duplication of efforts. The design and construction of this model has created flexibility to meet several management challenges that agencies are being faced with. The incident command system provides benefits to not only single agency command, but also multi-agency and unified command systems. So when we're talking about multi-agency, uh, we're referring to a coordinated response. So this is when unified command is, has not been established, a single agency has command over an incident, and other agencies are coordinating to, pro to provide support. So the use of the ICS model provides benefits to the agencies uh, by clearly defining the chain of command due to its modular format, uh, for allowing for a manageable span of control for management and supervisors. So we're looking at a ratio of one to one to seven at a max that I, that ideal span of control should be in there around one to five. Uh, so helping to create and outline a cre clear direction for roles and responsibilities and the use of common terminology, which ensures clear communication throughout the entire incident. So these are just a few of the benefits that uh, agencies are gonna see while using the ICS model. So when we start looking at how the organizational structure is going to grow throughout an incident, uh, there's a few different stages here. So this chart uh, displays a brief overview of how an organization may begin to structure their incident command system. So we'll look at each of these separately to understand how an incident may evolve and how the ICS creates an organized structure throughout this incident. So structured organizations such as the ICS is important to establish in the early or the beginning stages of any incident. Uh, so wildland firefighting itself, of course, is very challenging. Uh, when you start adding structures, communities, uh, infrastructure into this equation, I can add to the challenges and complexity of the situation. So it's important to note that the authority having jurisdiction is going to have the initial command of that incident and it shall remain in command throughout the entire incident. 
uh, incident command may be shared with other organizations through unified command, which we will get into in a few more slides here. Uh, so if that incident crosses those jurisdictional boundaries or involves other or multiple authorities that have jurisdiction with, within the area that that incident is taking place. So when we get into the initial attack organization, uh, we start opening up the, the org chart here. So during this stage uh, is typically when the initial response units will be managed by the first arriving officer who's gonna establish the command and assume role of the incident commander. The incident commander is going to perform all the roles of the command and general staff at this point in time and is going to be responsible for identifying the priorities and establishing the incident action plan. So during the initial attack stage, responding resources uh, would typically allow for a safe span of control for the incident commander. And many incidents at this stage are typically going to be controlled with the initial response units. Uh, however, they may also extend slightly uh, into the next level. So getting into that next level, we're going to start looking at reinforced response organization. So as the incident begins to escalate and additional resources are required, the span of control for this situation is going to extend beyond what a safe range for the incident commander is gonna look like. So this is gonna require the incident commander to start establishing divisions to maintain a span of control and command and general staff to provide functional support. So this chart, for example, is showing that the incident commander has assigned divisions uh, with qualified supervisors, this is helping to maintain a span of control. A uh, safety officer who's uh, going to be responsible to monitor the incident response uh, for any safety issues. Medical units, which will be established for emergency medical treatment. Resource units, which are going to assist the incident commander with... Oh, sorry about that. Let's back up here. Med, uh, resource units which will assist the incident commander with tracking resources and a logistics section chief to plan and implement logistical support at uh, the resources. So as we move forward through the incident and it continues to expand, we're gonna get into an extended attack organization. So, this is going to require the IC to request for additional resources. These resources uh, likely will be from your mutual aid departments uh, to begin with, with other municipalities. And due to the growing complexity of the incidents as they expand, the IC is going to continue to expand this organizational chart. So again, this chart, for example, is showing that more command staff has been established such as a public information officer, liaison officer. Uh, the operation section chief has been added, uh, who's gonna be responsible for that operation section. Uh, air tactical group supervisors and structural protection groups, again, underneath the operation section. Uh, situation unit, which is gonna be under the planning section. So this is gonna be for the collection of data. This is gonna aid in the planning of the event here. Uh, communication unit, which is gonna aid in logistics and a time unit for record keeping under finance and administration. So you can see as the incident begins to expand, it's getting more complex. Span of control is beyond what one uh, incident commander or supervisor can deal with at a time. So we gotta start assigning um, positions so that we can start dealing with all the logistical background details that take place on an incident. So each of these roles added are meant to aid in the functional support of the operation section and to ensure that safe span of control. As we get further here, looking into the multi-branch response, uh, this stage of the incident will begin to require multiple divisions with large geographic areas 
Uh, to ensure the highest level of safety during this situation, additional positions, again, within the organization are gonna need to be filled. So this chart moving forward again, for example, shows that the IC is also assigned branches, uh, air operations branch, planning section, assistant safety officers, general staff, and command staff. So as the incident has progressed, the authority having jurisdiction by this point will have reached out to their mutual aid partners, most likely cooperating agencies as it may involve other jurisdictions, and it may start looking at the need for unified command depending on where this incident's taking place and what borders it's starting to cross. So agencies need to be aware of the individual trigger points within the incident that are gonna indicate the need for that agency representative to join a command post or the need to enter into unified command. Uh, talking about mutual aid agreements. So no jurisdiction is ever gonna have enough resources to address every possible contingency. That's why these mutual aid agreements are so important. So within the emergency services, mutual aid is an agreement uh, that is designed to lend assistance across your jurisdictional boundaries. So this incident may, uh, may occur due to an emergency response that exceeds your local resources, um, such as a WUI event or, or any form of disaster. So according to a document that was published by the Alberta Emergency Management Agency titled the Alberta Wildland Urban Interface Fires 2015 under mutual aid agreement, it lays out some specific details at a minimum uh, that should be uh, uh, documented within that mutual aid agreement from responsibility and jurisdiction, uh, equipment and inventory that should be made available, Uh, the equipment capabilities of what you're making available, uh, any emergency contact information, uh, any communication protocols, uh, liabilities, and cost recovery procedures and limitations. Uh, so at a minimum, those are, that's some information that needs to be outlined within those agreements. So Mutual aid agreements allows for authorities to maintain a certain level of service and capabilities within their communities. Getting into unified command. So unified command is defined as a system in which the role of the incident commander is shared among two or more individuals already having authority in different jurisdictions. Unified command is a way for each agency with responsibilities to share in the incident management. And it's used to establish a common set of objectives and strategies for all agencies to work with. So this is also done without losing or giving up any authority or responsibility that those agencies have. Unified command represents an important element in increasing the effectiveness of the incidents that take place in multiple jurisdictions. And as incidents become more complex and involve more agencies, the need for unified command is increased. Uh, this also applies to both multi-jurisdictional and multi-agency incidents. So what we're referring to is whether that incident takes place in one jurisdiction with multiple agencies having authority or multiple jurisdictions with multiple agencies, uh, unified command can be applied to all situations. Uh, so there's several primary benefits uh, to utilizing the unified command system within large scale emergencies or disasters. A lot of these benefits can consist of one set of objectives that are gonna be developed for the entire incident. Uh, there's gonna be a collective approach that'll be made to developing strategies to achieve your incident objectives. The information flow and coordination is gonna be improved among all jurisdictions and agencies that are involved. All agencies with responsibility 
for this incident, uh, we'll be able to understand one another's priorities and their restrictions. No agency's authority or their legal requirements are compromised or neglected throughout the incident. And each agency is to be fully aware of the plans, actions, and all the constraints um, of all other agencies within the incident. The combined efforts of all agencies are optimized um, as their respective assignments are all under one single incident action plan and duplicative efforts are reduced or eliminated. So this, is, this also reduces costs and the chance for frustrations or conflict to arise. So unified command should remain intact until either the incident has de-escalated or the agencies with jurisdictional authority are no longer being affected by this incident. So when we start looking at some considerations, so unified command uh, should be considered between Alberta Ag and Forestry and the municipality if the following triggers are met during a wildland urban interface incident. So at a minimum, a representative should be in a command post if the authority having jurisdiction is going to be facing a potential impact. They should be invited into unified command if that authority is facing an immediate impact from the incident and they should be invited into unified command if that authority having jurisdiction is planning or executing evacuations within rural residents or communities. So those are all some considerations to, to take place when, when determining whether or not unified command should be, uh, should be looked at. Um, talking about best practices, uh, it's important to understand that as a municipality considers if unified command is applicable, uh, it should be implemented sooner rather than later. Uh, delegation of authority. So what that refers to is a statement usually provided by the incident commander, uh, provided, sorry, to the incident commander by the director of emergency management or its designate delegating authority and assigning responsibility. So the de delegation of authority can include objectives, priorities, expectations, constraints, and other considerations or guidelines as needed. So it's imperative that agencies who do join into unified command sign a delegation of authority, and this allows for cooperating agencies to act on behalf of that authority uh, within the specified incident. Moving on to state of local emergencies. So declaring a state of local emergency can allow for a municipality to exercise certain powers that are not available under the Municipal Government Act. The local authority can declare a state of local emergency at any time when there is or may be an emergency in the community provided that that authority believes there's a significant emergency that exists and that poses a serious threat to the people or property within that community. Uh, so according to the Alberta Emergency Management Act Part 2 under powers of local authority uh, on making a declaration of state of local emergency and for the duration of that emergency the local authority may do a at uh, do all acts and take all necessary proceedings such as exercising the powers uh, given by the minister under section 19.1 in relation to part of that municipality affected. Uh, so when we're, when we're talking about that some of those powers that can be granted by the minister are going to include areas such as controlling for prohibiting travel to and from any area within Alberta uh, order the evacuation of, of, of any people, uh, authorize the entry into buildings and, and uh, on any land without a warrant, and can cause the demolition or removal of trees, structures, or crops if the removal is necessary to reach the scene of a disaster. Um, so that being said, the, the list of powers granted by the minister uh, far exceeds what I've just listed there 
Um, but those are some key points that are going to uh, directly affect us in regards to um, dealing with the wildland urban interface fires. Um, so it's also important that municipalities have an understanding um, of what those powers are. Uh, so when we look at the response timeline, uh, right from the initial attack through to dealing with mutual aid, um, reaching out to the Provincial Operations Centre, uh, there, there's a few different kind of stages here. Now most of these incidents are typically handled within that initial attack stage um, and agencies need to be aware of those trigger points during this stage that are going to require them to consider further assistance. Uh, when we get into the mutual aid, uh, if resources and the manpower at this point are becoming overwhelmed or are being taxed, um, the agencies can start considering contacting the Provincial Operations Centre, uh, also known as the POC, you might hear that a lot, um, to request for further uh, resources or assistance with what's happening. Uh, so talking about the Provincial Operations Centre, uh, basically they're an essential resource for logistics. Uh, so they're going to aid in requesting and obtaining resources uh, and or equipment that are requested by the agencies to assist with that incident. And of course, state of local emergency, uh, and that can be essentially declared at any one of these instances throughout the timeline. And municipalities declaring that state of local emergency may, at the approval of the minister, be granted special powers to aid in this uh, emergency. Now, keep in mind that state of local emergency uh, does not mean that that municipalities are obligated to act on these powers, but what it does is it just provides them with the ability to do so if the conditions start to change rapidly. Uh, so that concludes uh, my portion in regards to the organizational structure. Uh, again, it might have been a refresher for some um, and new information for others. I hope everyone took something out of that. And I'm going to pass it over from here to Mike Vig. Thanks, Rob. Hi, my name is Mike Vig. I'm a member of the Clearwater Regional Fire Rescue Services Wildland Urban Interface Team. I'll be talking to you about equipment and resources. Equipment and resources. With equipment and resources, you must maintain a reserve. If you're using all the resources, you don't have enough. You should always have extra as a tactical reserve. Also, as the incident grows, you'll require more resources. If there are multiple fires happening within the province, you may be competing for available resources with other communities. Not all firefighting resources are created equal. You must ensure that the proper resource is committed to the job in order to meet the objective. I'll have more on this on the next slide. Equipment and resources fall into one of these three categories, either a strike team, task force, or single unit resource. A strike team, is the same type and kind of resource. So a group of water tenders shuttling water would be a strike team. They would have an assigned strike team leader. Task force is a mixture of different types and kinds of resources to complete a task. You may have an engine, a tender, and an SPU crew as a task force. If you get these uh, mixed up, a uh, simple way to remember is strike is a like. And then single unit resource is a single resource that is still under a division in the organization, usually a specialty resource such as a sprinkler trailer, a tactical tender, or utility worker with a service truck.
There we go, that's right. This slide shows the ICS typing standards for sizing of equipment. Basically, type one is the biggest and most equipped type. Then it goes down incrementally for the resource. As you can see uh, under the engines, there's one to seven, seven being the smallest. Type one may be the biggest, but not necessarily the best resource for the job. For example, if you ask for a type three engine, because you require pump and roll capabilities, you don't want to get a type one that will cost more, plus may not do the job as needed. Typing must be the provincial ICS typing and not some local authorities typing model. If you look on the bottom of the list, you'll see bulldozer tender. It has nothing to do with water. It is a fuel supply for the bulldozer, which could be a slip tank in the back of a pickup truck, as long as it holds the minimum 100 gallons. It has nothing to do with water hauling. It is a truck used for fueling up dozers. Something else to remember is water trucks are tenders, not tankers. Tankers are airplanes. So you have to be careful what you ask for. The wording and sizing are very important. Business as usual. You may not want your department to deploy to a wooey incident that is hours away when your own area is at a high or extreme fire hazard. And when deploying, departments should use spare equipment when possible and have arrangements made for coverage at home. Sometimes a good idea to consider deploying with other departments in your region if there are manpower or equipment concerns. The province has six structure protection trailers that should be used first at an incident when possible. So whether it's the department that is deploying or the local department at the incident, you always have to make sure home is covered because your regular calls are gonna keep coming in. Early activation of resources. The early detection and activation is critical for a safe and effective deployment of resources. This stage helps to ensure the greatest chance for property protection and preservation. Recognize the need for resources early. The incident can very quickly overwhelm the current resources actioning the incident. Determine priorities of potential risk. Some infrastructure may require dedicated resources or extra resources due to their importance within the local community. Exa examples of that could be hospitals, gas plants, mills that provide employment or essential services. Determine resources needed. You gotta determine the right type of resource and the right amount. Time consideration for deployment. How long it will take from the time the initial order of resources is made to the time it arrives at incident check-in. And then the setup of equipment is the time it takes from incident check-in to the time it takes for the resources to complete the setup on the incident. So the benefits of early activation are staying ahead of the incident hazards. It minimizes lag time for resource response, increases safety of the community, and decreases potential loss. A good rule of thumb, if there is an evacuation notice, you should be ordering resources. And if there's an evacuation order, the re resources should be setting up. <clears throat> equipment tracking. 
Always identify your equipment. You can spray paint it, use stickers right on it, whatever works for you. But if it's labeled, you have a better chance of getting your own equipment back after the incident. The WUI plaque card, ICS 231, shown on the slide, is designed to document property information found during structure assessment. It is placed in a highly visible location at the end of the driveway and allows the firefighters to communicate a basic assessment of conditions to other responding units. But be mindful of public perception of the information on the placard. Equipment used can be tracked by attaching an inventory list to the back of the ICS 231 placard. Uh, it can also be tracked using the Avenza app. By dropping a pin for the location and adding the equipment list in with the notes. You should also take pictures of the location and any setup that is done. This can also be stored on Avenza. This information is then passed on to the appropriate division supervisor. Equipment list should include all fittings, hose, and sprinklers used, and must include pump serial number and its GPS location, as the water supply may be at a distance. Often trucks will be labeled with the same unit numbers. For an example, engine one is very common for many departments. To avoid confusion, resources are assigned an incident unit number typically written on the windshield. These numbers will be centrally tracked. So now what was known as engine one back home will become possibly engine four, engine five, or E4 will be written on the windshield. And that uh, about covers it for uh, equipment and resources. I'm gonna pass this back to Jared. He's gonna to touch on insurance and liability. Thanks, Mike. Hello, everyone again, Jared here. So I'm gonna finish off this presentation with a few things to think about in regards of insurance and liability. This is not to explain what coverage to have, rather just to give you some things to think about. So in, municipalities need to ensure that crews and equipment are adequately insured prior to any response, whether it be local or provincial. This can include, but not limited to, WCB coverage and replacement coverage for apparatus or other equipment. Also, municipalities dealing with or planning for WUI events should establish a claims and compensation process for the recovery phase of an incident. The process should allow for occupants or property owners to report damage to a property that can be verified by documentation that in fact, the crews did enter the property and conduct work that supports the damage being reported. Municipalities also should expect inadvertent minor damage to properties from suppression or protection tactics. Things such as uh, screw holes used to secure sprinkler systems. Firefighting crews operate in a manner to minimize damage to property. However, any and all damage cannot be avoided in some cases. Reclamation costs that may also be claimed by the property owner for things like equipment guards being used to stop or decrease fire growth. This is why it is paramount that crews record and fill out proper documentation during, sorry, before, during, and after the fire. 
The forms and other information can be found here in the Alberta Structure Protection Program Operational Guidelines. So conclusion here, <clears throat> wildfires are not, are, sorry, unfortunately inevitable. However, knowing where to find the interface zones and with proper planning, preparation, and strategies like prevention and mitigation can lessen the damage caused by wildfire. Knowledge of the wild, of the fire weather forecasting system can help you better predict and understand the potential for fire and expected fire behavior. Following the ICS organizational structure and unified command best practices can and will effectively and efficiently handle the incident right from start to finish. Understanding the need for early activation of resources before current resources are overwhelmed can greatly increase the chance of reducing the impact that the fire can have on a community. Having proper plans and policies in place before an incident happens will decrease the stress and workload on everyone in the long run. Remember, it's about the incident outcome and what's best for the community as a whole. We'd like to say thank you to the high level WE team for helping build this program and to the Alberta Fire Chiefs Association for providing the funding to make this program possible. We'd also like to thank the Alberta Fire Training Officers Association for facilitating this presentation today. And of course, thank you to everyone for attending the Alberta Wildland Urban Interface for Leaders presentation. If you have any questions or comments, please feel free to reach out to any of us. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, once again, thank you guys for taking the opportunity this afternoon to listen in to this uh, webinar. Uh, again, please provide your questions and comments. Uh, we'll be up on the side here for a little bit answering some questions. Uh, but if you have any comments, uh, things you'd like to see in the presentation or adjustments to it, please let us know. Give us a, uh, an email. It's one of those email addresses there. Um, also, I know Chief Schmidt's done a lot of work for this BUI program, so I think a huge thank you out to him. Um, he's spent a lot of time putting it together, and he is the lead for the project for the AFCA. So in closing, thank you very much, and we'll hang out on the side there for a little bit to answer some questions.